Hi there, welcome to our unit on Mexico. I'm gonna start with a brief, thoroughly incomplete overview of the history of Mexico, just hitting on some important points that are gonna be relevant as we talk about Mexico's uh, politics. Um, first, just some really basic facts about geography and demography. Uh, Mexico is the largest country in the Spanish speaking world with about 129 million people. That's a little less than 40% of the population of the United States. Um, and the large majority of those people identify themselves as having a mix of Spanish and Native American heritage. The term mestizo is commonly used to describe those people in English, um, although you actually hear it somewhat less frequently in Mexico. That term might be familiar to you, incidentally, if you've taken AP US history, a little more on the history of that in a moment. Um, and somewhere between uh, 10 and maybe as high as 28%, I think that's the number of, in your textbook of people in Mexico, identify themselves as indigenous. Those numbers tend to vary um, based on how the survey is conducted and how indigeneity is defined. Um, but there is a significant minority of people who identify themselves as having primarily indigenous, so pre-European heritage. Um, two features about how Mexico's population is distributed, which are going to become relevant as we talk about Mexico's politics. First thing you want to note is that the indigenous population is concentrated in the south of Mexico. Second thing is that the north of Mexico, closer to the United States border tends to be a good deal wealthier uh, and more economically productive than the south of Mexico, which is more rural and agricultural. Those are the pure basic facts about uh, demography and geography. We'll return to those over and over and over again, especially as we talk about social cleavages in Mexico. Um, I'm going to do a real abbreviated form of Mexican history. Um, there's plenty more that we could say, of course, if you take AP World or if you take a Latin American history course, uh, which I hope that you will, but this isn't the class for that. Um, before the um, arrival of European conquistadors from Spain in the early 16th century, um, there are two major civilizations that emerge in Mexico that you've probably heard about, in addition to a number which I'm not going to mention today. Um, the first is the Mayans. You might have talked about those in your previous studies of world history. Um, in this area, it's concentrated in this area known as the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, marked in green on your screen. Um, the Mayans disappear for reasons that we're still not super sure about around the 10th century, but prior to that, they've developed really impressive um, accomplishments in the areas of architecture and astronomy, astrology. Um, they have a kind of decentralized city-state system. There is not a single um, center of the Mayan empire, but they do leave behind um, a good deal of archeological remains um, and a good deal of cultural heritage, which persists in Mexico to this day. The other in the civilization that persists up to the moment of contact with Europeans is the Aztec empire. Um, centered in the city of Tenochtitlan, um, on the uh, ruins of which Mexico City is now built. Um, that rises to prominence in the 15th century, and it's what Spanish conquistadors encounter when they show up in Mexico in 1519. Worth noting that the Aztec Empire is super, super sophisticated uh, in terms of its architecture, in terms of its science, in terms of its um, city planning abilities, uh, in terms of its political structure. Uh, this is a really wealthy and powerful empire empire that's conquered a bunch of people and kind of forced them into tribute relationships. They have somehow managed to support a fairly large urban population in the middle of a lake, uh, which is no small feat. Um, they have, you know, running, they have, they have a sewage system uh, at a time when people in London, for instance, are still um, doing their business in chamber pots and dump, more or less dumping it onto the street or into the river from which they get their drinking water. So the Aztecs are a pretty impressive civilization, um, but Crucially, they don't have gunpowder, um, and they'll be conquered by Hernan Cortes and uh, Spanish conquistadors um, who arrive in 1519 and complete that conquest by 1522. The Spanish proceed to rule uh, Mexico for the next 300 years, and there's just three features of that that I want to point out. The first is that the economy is essentially extractive. Mexico and other parts of Spanish colonies in the Americas um, have rich deposits of silver, among other resources, and a big feature of Spanish rule is essentially forcing Native Americans into labor uh, to extract silver from those mines. Um, this has devastating consequences for, for Native people um, as a result of the harsh working conditions, as well as the proliferation of diseases that are introduced 
by the Spanish, to which people have no natural resistance in the Americas because they've never encountered them before. And the consequence of that is that the native population declines drastically over the course of Spanish rule. Um, so this is not an economy which is gonna industrialize under the Spanish. They're not gonna develop a huge amount of infrastructure. You should not expect to see public education super widespread. This is an essentially exploitative economy uh, based on various forms of forced labor. Second thing to point out is that politically, there are also not really moves towards democratization or consultation or representation uh, for broad numbers of people. Um, the Spanish colonies in Mexico and elsewhere in uh, the New World, as they call it, um, are ruled by people called viceroys, which is basically the king's representative um, in the colonies. Um, and the viceroy more or less rules with an iron fist. So you should not expect to see the development of like legislatures or assemblies or a house of Burgesses type equivalent uh, the way you do in some English colonies in the Americas, at least among property owning white men. In Spain, even less of that. Final feature of Spanish rule that's worth pointing out is that the racial system is somewhat different from the one that develops in British colonies in North America. Um, because the Spaniards who come to the New World are primarily men, uh, as opposed to sort of intact family units, you see a lot more intermarriage um, between people of European, indigenous, and African descent uh, in the Spanish colonies in the New World. Um, that creates something that's not necessarily any less racist than the system that emerged emerges in North America, um, but the lines are somewhat blurrier and the racial categories are somewhat more numerous. In AP World, we talk about this as the Costa system you might have talked about in previous studies as well, um, but it does, among other things, explain the large percentage of people in Mexico today who identify themselves as having this kind of unique mix of European and indigenous heritage that emerges during Spanish rule. Um, in starting in 1810 and lasting through 1821, there's a complex and interesting series of events which is going to lead Mexicans to declare and achieve their independence from Spain. I won't get into it a great deal here, um, but the, the crucial point to know for our purposes is that the Mexican independence movement sort of starts out as this very radical populist power to the people um, sort of uh, movement and then gets sort of co-opted or taken over by much more conservative people in Mexico elite who are actually really interested in gaining independence because they want to preserve their uh economic and social status at the top of a very, very unequal social and economic system. So Mexico achieves independence in 1821 and is going to proceed to be ruled by a series of strong men known as Cadillos, um, who exercise power um, more or less undemocratically um, and who are going to continue to, there's going to be a fair amount of instability and there's going to be a fair amount of inequality in this period as well, um, often at the expense of ordinary people in Mexico. Fast forward to 1876, when that cycle of, you know, coup d'etat, people being overthrown, people maybe being a little bit assassinated or dying suspiciously, is actually going to be interrupted by a ruler known as Porfirio Diaz. Um, the period of his rule is known as the Porfiriato after his first name. Diaz comes to power in a coup d'etat, so he takes power illegally, he overturns the result of an election by force, um, and he promises that he's going to serve only one term as president. He ends up in power for the next 35 years. At one point, he'll back out of the presidency and have one of his friends take it, but in one way or another, Diaz is calling the shots from 1876 all the way through 1911. Um, and again, this is not a super democratic uh, regime. He will continue to hold elections, but they will not necessarily be super representative of the people's will. He has all kinds of ways of repressing dissent. Um, the best thing you can say about Diaz is that he does inaugurate a really long period of political stability. Uh, this is a country that for the previous 50 years has been seeing constant turnover in its leadership. And under Diaz, there is a fair amount of stability and continuity in governance. Diaz is interest is basically in developing Mexico's economy, in industrializing Mexico, and the way he sees fit to do that is by seeking out a lot of foreign investment um, from the United States and Europe primarily. Um, and he sees political stability, among other things, as a way to convince foreign investors that Mexico is a good place for them to park their money uh, and earn a return on their investment. So you start to see a lot of foreign capital pouring into Mexico under Diaz's regime. And a lot of that is used to industrialize Mexico, um, to build some crucial infrastructure in terms of things like roads and railroads. 
But the flip side of that is that this money is generally not going to be used in a way that benefits Mexico's workers and its rural poor. So you see inequality continue to grow under the Diaz regime. Uh, and also a side note, which is going to become important in a couple of decades, is that Diaz will also sell most of the rights to extract Mexico's oil to foreign investors. Towards the end of his rule in 1908, Porfirio Diaz makes this kind of offhanded comment to a reporter that Mexicans might be ready for democracy um, and that, you know, it might be appropriate for him to step down as president. People see this announcement, they interpret it as Diaz saying that he is not going to be a candidate in the next presidential election in 1910. And immediately this wave of political organizing springs forth. Mexicans start forming political parties. They start declaring the candidacy for the presidency and they start articulating a bunch of different visions for Mexico's future. Diaz uh, kind of tries to take it back. It doesn't work. There's lots that we could say about the Mexican revolution uh, that I don't want to spend too much time on today. But long story short, Diaz manages in the early 1900s um, to win enemies among a bunch of different groups, some of whom have, who all have very different uh, political ideologies and ideas about what Mexico's future should look like. So he's overthrown by a combination of these different opponents by 1911, but then through 1920, those groups are going to contest each other for power. Um, the events of the Mexican Revolution are super complicated. You're going to see lots of sort of regional differences in what's happening. You're going to see some people advocating this very moderate constitutionalist um, future for Mexico, which is going to look pretty much like what Diaz was doing, except with regular changes in the presidency. You're going to see other people advocating a kind of rural agrarian socialism, especially among indigenous Mexicans in the South. One name that we associate with that latter campaign is Emiliano Zapata, um, who leads this campaign for very rapidly radical land reform uh, for, for increasing the amount of power to Mexico's peasants. He's ultimately unsuccessful, but his name is going to come back up in 1994. We'll get to that when we talk about Mexico's economic history later in this unit. Um, the signal accomplishment to the Mexican Revolution, other than getting Diaz out of power, um, is the ratification of a constitution in 1917, which remains the basis for Mexico's government today. And there's a couple of important uh, provisions in the 1917 constitution that are worth talking about today. The first is the principle of no re-election. Um, Diaz has essentially found ways to keep himself in power for 35 years. The revolutionaries are pretty united uh, in the idea that that shouldn't be allowed to happen in the post-Diaz Mexico. Um, and so one of the central tenets of uh, Mexico's 1917 constitution says that national legislators, governors of Mexico's states, and the president cannot be re-elected. They are all going to be one-term politicians. Um, those terms have been relaxed for legislators, but it remains true in Mexico today that the president can only serve one six-year term. There is no presidential re-election in present-day Mexico. Second thing that the 1917 constitution does is to impose some serious limits on the Catholic Church, which had been extremely powerful um, in a uh, you know, Spanish rule, uh, in the period of Spanish rule, um, and which had been an important supporter for the Diaz regime. And so there's really serious limits imposed on the Catholic Church and on the priesthood under the 1917 Constitution, which will be rolled back gradually over the course of the 20th century. Finally, there's a very strong nationalist, populist, sort of statist element to the 1917 constitution, which specifically bans foreigners and foreign companies from owning land and from owning Mexico's subsoil resources. So things like silver, gold, and crucially oil. Um, there will be some more political instability even after that constitution um, is ratified, but eventually um, by 1929, you're going to see order start to be restored in Mexico under the rule of a single party. So Mexico has created this system um, where there are democratic elections, at least on paper, um, but the single party called the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, manages to consolidate control. Um, the PRI is formed in 1929, initially under a different name, but as it goes from a revolutionary party to a more stable institutionalized party, it changes its name to reflect that identity. Um, and the PRI proceeds for the next 70 years to continuously control the presidency, uh, the legislature, and almost all elements of local government, which is pretty remarkable in a revolution which had been uh, inaugurated in part with the explicit demand that we have some changeover in power. Um, 
Under pre-rule, presidents, according to the Constitution, according to that rule that remains in place today, serve a six-year, a single six-year term known as the Sesenio, um, without the possibility of re-election. Um, and the strong tradition, this is not written anywhere in Mexican law, but the strong tradition under the pre is that the outgoing president has the power to pick his successor, and it has always been him. Mexico has never had a female president. Um, and so what that does is to consolidate a lot of power in the party to the extent that there is political conflict. It happens within the PRI and not between the PRI and other parties. Once the president is in power, um, he knows that his time is limited, but there's virtually no checks on that power. And that gives the president a huge amount of leverage to do what he wants to shape Mexican national policy and also to use the resources of the state in a way that are going to help in ways that are going to help ensure that he and his party will be able to remain in power for a while. The pre's, um, part, one of the pre's secrets to success is that basically every ambitious politician in Mexico, which, with some notable exceptions that we'll talk about in a minute, join the pre. They kind of understand if you, if you were a person who is interested in a governorship or in a seat in the Senate in Mexico, it's pretty obvious to you that the best route to power, the best way to fulfill your ambitions is to join the pre. Um, if you're watching this video, I'd actually like you to pause here um, and just take a second to jot down in your notebook some ideas for just hypothetically, I'm not saying you're gonna do this in your life, but if you were to try and maintain a one party rule uh, in a state that provided for free and fair elections, think about how you would do it. All right, hopefully you waited for more than three seconds trying to answer that question. I'm going to tell you some ways in which the PRI went about maintaining its rule for 70 years, despite all of the democratic features in Mexico's constitution. Um, first, the important, I think, the, I would argue the defining principle of the PRI um, is its promise of rotation in office. Um, if I am an ambitious politician in Mexico during the Diaz period, and I see that he keeps promising to step down, promising to step down, but it's been 30 some years and he's still in office, that might make me want to exit his party or, or exit the electoral system altogether and try and launch some sort of extra legal um, outside the law approach to getting him out of power. The PRI, by contrast, has this promise that not only the presidency, but also all of these important jobs in the legislature and the state government level um, are going to change over on a regular basis. And so that principle of rotation in office and the PRI's ability to honor rotation in office is an important way of making sure that everybody who wants power buys into the PRI's system because it ensures that they'll have a reasonable chance at getting their turn pretty soon. A second thing is that the PRI embraces this populist rhetoric, describing itself as being the party that's most in support of what the people want, of what the people, what's good for the people. And specifically, it demands a few things uh, in terms of its economic policy that are fairly popular, especially in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, so the PRI calls for land reform, and that's going to be extremely appealing, particularly to poor farmers in Mexico's more rural south, saying that it wants to distribute land that's been owned by these large predatory um, landowners uh, and put it in the hands of the farmers who actually work it. Um, a second thing that the PRI does in 1938 under President Lazaro Cardenas is to nationalize oil, to boot out foreign companies, to boot private investors out of Mexico's oil industry, and to create a company called Pemex, which we'll talk about a lot in this unit, um, that controls the oil uh, and that it's supposed to give all revenues to the Mexican government for the good of the Mexican people. That's a fairly popular move, um, and it ties into the the third thing that the PRI does in terms of its populist economic platform, which is to call for Mex Mexicanization of the overall uh, Mexican economy, to reduce the influence of foreign investors who had been brought in during the Diaz regime, and to promote Mexican ownership of Mexico's assets and businesses. A third thing the PRI does is a strategy called corporatism, which we talked about a little bit when we talked about strategies of less democratic rule or of authoritarian states, which is to say that the PRI tries to create these bodies within its own party structure um, that approximate what civil society organizations might do in a fully democratic society. So instead of joining an independent labor union, for instance, teachers in Mexico join a pre-sponsored labor union, um, and that serves as a mechanism uh, for teachers to communicate what they want to the ruling party, but also for the ruling party to communicate what they want to teachers and to use those members uh, of that union, of that party-sponsored union, um, as a way of supporting pre-rule. 
people. They, so they create major organizations for workers, for peasants, for the middle class. At one point, the pre creates a different sector for the army, but later that's merged into one of its, one of its three main sectors. Um, and that's an important way for the pre to get ordinary people involved uh, in the party, as opposed to letting them go off and form organizations that might threaten the pre's power. A fourth way that the pre maintains its uh, authority for so long is good old fashioned patronage, which is to say, when you control the resources of a state, especially if the state that you control has a bunch of oil revenue coming in, you can use those resources to keep people on your side. And so people who support the pre get preferential access to jobs, their businesses get preferential access to contracts where they can perform various tasks and be paid well by the state, they get preferential access to oil revenue, um, and their government offices put them in a position to accept good old-fashioned bribes. And so just if you are, even if you're a completely apolitical individual, even if you don't really care about Mexican politics, it's in your interest to join the PRI or to form some connections with your local PRI elected official, because that's likely to improve the material condition of your life. Finally, towards the end, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, um, the PRI just starts resorting to uh, election fraud. Um, and that's a, a that's actually going to end up being one of the the things that kind of puts the nail in the priest's coffin um, when people start realizing that their elections have very obviously not been conducted in a transparent and honest way, and that the pre is responsible for that. The end of one party rule um, begins in earnest in the 1980s, but the seeds are actually sown as far back as 1939, um, when some people who aren't very, whose interests aren't really well represented by the PRI form a dissident party called the PAN or the National Action Party. These acronyms reflect the Spanish language, not the English, which is why they might, might not make immediate sense to English speakers. Um, which is formed to represent the interests of two major groups, businesses and the Catholic Church, um, which have been largely disenfranchised by the PRI, uh, which have often been attacked using the PRI's populist rhetoric. The PAN is going to be the major organized opposition to the PRI for the next several decades. They aren't going to win a governorship. They aren't going to win a major election until the 1980s, but they will be a fairly consistent thorn in the PRI's side, and they'll become important uh, at the very end of this lecture. Um, then fast forward to the 1980s. Um, in 1985, there's a major earthquake in Mexico City, uh, which is deadly consequences that causes immense loss of life and property damage. And the pre's response is pretty widely criticized as being slow and ineffective. And that's going to set off this chain of events, which will ultimately lead to the end of one party rule. In 1988, a number of leftists within the PRI, remember that as the major party in Mexico, the PRI has to encompass a pretty broad variety of ideological positions. And so there's always these battles between leftists and rightists within the PRI. Um, in 1988, leftists have been um, campaigning for the next presidential nominee of their party. Um, to be a relatively leftist candidate, and the outgoing president rejects their choice and chooses a much more centrist candidate. And those leftists, instead of saying, oh, well, we'll get our turn in 1994, actually do something quite radical, which the PRI is supposed to prevent, which is to actually leave the party and form a new party called the PRD, the Democratic Revolutionary Party. And that's going to be Mexico's major leftist party for the next 30 plus years. Um, the those they actually run their candidate um, in the 1988 election, um, and the pre has a really difficult time getting people not to vote for this leftist candidate, um, and so they keep themselves in power. But it's pretty widely agreed that there's widespread fraud being used um, to get the pre candidate to win that election, and that's going to really undermine the pre's legitimacy because all of a sudden um, there are these widespread rumors going around that the pre basically stole the election um, by failing to count the ballots correctly. Correctly. Um, in 1994, there's a separate um, a separate issue uh, arises in the south of Mexico, uh, particularly centered in Chiapas State, um, known as the Zapatista Uprising. We'll talk about NAFTA. You've probably heard about it in the news in the last few years. Later in this unit, um, but Mexico uh, in the 1990s joins a three-country trade pact known as the North American Free Trade Agreement, which really lowers a lot of the barriers to trade between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. 
One effect of Mexico joining the NAFTA pact um, is that all of a sudden Mexicans can buy really cheap corn from American farmers who get huge amounts of subsidies from the United States government. And that's going to be really, really bad for uh, corn farmers in the south of Mexico who suddenly are facing this competition that they just can't win. Um, that's going to kind of layer on top of the grievances that have long been felt by indigenous people in the south of Mexico who feel disenfranchised and disrespected by the, me by the Mexican federal government. Um, and that's going to result in an armed uprising, uh, which really reaches its peak in the mid-1990s, um, known as the Zapatista uprising, trying to reclaim the legacy of the, Z of the uh, rebels under Emiliano Zapata in the era of the Mexican Revolution. Um, they don't get Mexico to withdraw from Na to withdraw from NAFTA, um, but they create a major disturbance and they start to call into question whether the PRI is really capable of maintaining order and security um, in Mexico. Um, and so in 2000, the PRI is facing the situation where their legitimacy and popularity have been seriously dented and where they kind of realize that if they commit more electoral fraud this time around, they might be facing an even bigger uprising. Um, the consequence of that is that there's a three-way uh, hotly contested election between candidates from the PAN, the PRI, and the PRD in 2000. Uh, and the winner is um, Vicente Fox, a uh, cons relatively conservative candidate representing the National Action Party. Um, he wins the presidency, marking the definitive end of one-party rule in Mexico. We'll leave it there for now. Of course, feel free to email me with any questions. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.